Okay, and we are streaming live on Facebook. Welcome everybody. We're just gonna wait a few moments for other people to join us and then we'll go ahead and get started. Just Stephanie got the alert on my phone that we are live. So that's always the big technology has worked another day. Is there a way to know how many people come on? Um, there is. We can ask Nina after um, just because I don't really pay attention to that. I just more focus on like the comment pieces when we're going. But yes, there is. Because I've never done a Zoom that's also on Facebook. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, you get used to it. It's, it's kind of hard if you're trying to watch both because there's a lag. So that's why I don't actually pay attention to what's happening on Facebook. I only look at the comments because otherwise it, like, it gets pretty confusing. Yeah. Yeah. Welcome though, everybody who has just joined us. Um, we'll go ahead and get started in just a few minutes. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for coming tonight. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, we have got just a few announcements to begin the to begin our evening together here tonight. So first and foremost, just a reminder that we do have our annual CAGT conference coming up October 16th to 18th. Um, we will be at the Embassy Suite in Loveland, Colorado, and we hope to have you come. Our theme this year is Unconventionally, Unconditionally Gifted. And um, those of you who work with gifted children can probably think of several students who fit that bill. Um, so just coming together to learn from one another and celebrate um, one another, our work, and first and foremost, the students that we work with every single day. Um, so we're very excited for that. We know that quite a few people are on fall break and we would encourage you that um, if it is still something that you're interested in, come on and join us in um, Loveland. The nice thing, I guess, with that is you don't have to write any sub plans for that. So always a little perk. Um, our early bird is over. And so the prices have raised a little bit, but only by $15. So we hope that um, you all can make it still. We also have our Family Institute evening on the night of October 16th. So definitely hope that you join us there as well. And with that, um, uh, we are going to go ahead and um, start for the evening. So for those of you who um, don't know me, my name is Dr. Colleen Ehrlich. I am the president for the Colorado Association for Gifted and Talented. And I am here tonight with Ms. Stephanie Tolan. And I'm so excited. Um, I have a little bio to read. Uh, I have her real bio and then the one that she told us to tell. <laughs> so I'm going to start with the one that she told us about. So she wants us to share that she has spoken and written about giftedness since Guiding the Gifted Child came out in 1982. All of her novels are strictly realistic fiction and this other dimension of intelligence that she'll be speaking about today did not enter her consciousness until she was 50. Having been raised by a strict rational materialist, which I had to kind of think through what that meant for a hot second. Um, <laughs> being raised by a strict rational materialist, she didn't believe in any, as she would have said, weird stuff. So no weird stuff until she was 50. And then at a gathering for profoundly gifted kids and their parents in the Adirondacks in 1992, the kids in her creative writing group interacted telepathically 
undeniably and her worldview began to change. So she wrote, welcome to the ark. Once parents were encouraged to tell their stories without fear of ridicule, evidence began to pile up. And what she always knew was that her imagination took her to a new dimension. So open minds and open doors. So um, uh, her, if you don't know a little of background, she'll be talking today about a presentation, Gifted Dimensions of Intelligence. But she is also a very well-known playwright and Newbery Award-winning author for surviving the Apple Whites. Um, she wrote 27 books for children and young adults. She co -author, was a co-author of Guiding the Gifted Child and the author of Is It a Cheetah, an essay that has been translated into 40 languages. She has written and spoken about the social, emotional, and spiritual needs of the gifted for four decades, and much of that writing is collected in the book Out of Sync, um, which is available at Royal, Press, um, Royal Fireworks Press. And her most recent nonfiction work for adults is Change Your Story, Change Your Life, available through Amazon and Kindle. So please join me in welcoming Stephanie Tolan as she talks to us this evening about gifted dimensions of intelligence. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. So I'm going to share my screen now, yes? Okay. Yes. Okay. I named it Gifted Dimensions of Intelligence for the reasons I'll explain in a moment. But the reason gifted is in quotes is I wanted to do a little bit about the history of the term before intelligence testing, testing was created, back before Binet, back before Lita Hollingworth, gifted meant psychic. When you said somebody was gifted, you were suggesting that that person had contact with non-physical realities that perhaps other people did not. But then came intelligence testing and gifted became intelligence. Um, and it wasn't just intelligence per se, it was rational intelligence that it was mostly focused on. Um, and, the reason I use dimensions, well, there's a couple of reasons, but one of them is that most people think of levels of intelligence. And when you have IQ tests, there are lower levels of, of test scores and medium levels and higher levels. And so people tend to think of it as, as how much of something that you have. And in this case, my talk tonight is going to be about dimensions of intelligence, because that rational intelligence is not the only thing we have going for us, we humans. So there are actually multiple dimensions. And <laughs> two dimensions, that's really simple. You can draw a two-dimensional triangle and you can draw a three-dimensional triangle, gets a little tricky. When you get to four, it gets a little harder. Um, so it gets to aspects or dimensions of mind that I wanna, I wanna talk about. And one of the dimensions that I'm going to talk about tonight is on this slide. Everybody knows about intellect. Everybody knows about rational intelligence. And many people think that that is the sole definition of giftedness. Um, <laughs> they wouldn't maybe want to call it mundane intelligence, but it's, it's how human beings operate in the world for knowing about and navigating that physical world and for learning. Um, information and for using language and so on. And if you think in left brain, right brain terms, which is a little, a little uncertain these days, but um, it's mostly left brain intelligence that people think of when they are thinking of intellectually gifted people. And that's associated with the head or the brain. But 
Oh, I always know I have to be careful with the, with the mouse. It carries itself away. But intuition is non-rational intelligence. It's an entirely different way of knowing. And it's often associated with the heart. I don't know whether it was the last journal of uh, advanced devel development, but I think it probably was. I did, a, I did an article uh, on intuition. And the reason I want to talk about it with parents of gifted kids is that because the parents of gifted kids are mostly gifted and because the concept of gifted has been so associated with intellect and so associated with rationality, I wanted to help parents to be on the lookout for another aspect of their children's minds that may be extremely important to them. And it is that non-rational intelligence, which is often associated with the heart. So uh, an easy way to talk about different kinds of mental capacities is to think about imagination because everybody knows what that means. Um, I love this image because that was me as a kid, you know, um, I'm a writer. So I have been telling stories, um, reading stories, telling stories, making up stories, playing out stories for my whole life. And that involves imagination. And there are some people who have lots of that. Some people may have less imagination, but it can be developed just as rational intelligence can. So now these other words, imaginary is what most people think of when they think of imagination. That's things that are imaginary exist only in the imagination. They are unreal. And so we have, you know, the wizard and the, and the castle in the clouds as imaginary places. And the world right now is full of novels that are um, sci-fi fantasy. And I'll tell you a secret. The reason is because the world is changing so fast that writers for kids have trouble keeping up with the way things are changing. And so it's easier to make up a world and put your characters in an imaginary world than it is to keep up with the world as it is changing at a great rate. But the other word that is not as well known is imaginal, which was developed because it was discovered <laughs> that Sufis and uh, Other, other folks who have different ways of looking at reality, um, mystics, for instance, have something that if you call it imaginary, it immediately is thought to be unreal because imaginary means unreal. But we need something that is created only of thought, only in the mind for ourselves, but it has actual existence. And there's a very famous um, art work. I had to use this particular image, but there's a famous artwork that shows the world as this curved thing and a person sticking their head outside of that curve of the world and looking at something else that is real. It just is not physically present. Now, many of you will have heard of Michael Pofsky, and I hope lots of you have this book mellow out. They say, if only I could, because this is um, one of the best, one of the best um, books about what it's like to be a gifted kid 
um, and how one's mind is working and how one's world works. Um, and so in this book, he develop, devotes entire chapters to both invisible friends and imaginary worlds. Now, most of us who were gifted kids had imaginary worlds and maybe invisible friends. Lots of kids do. And I did when I was a little kid. And my parents were moderately okay with that. Um, his name was TD. And the most exciting time in my life was the time we were going on a trip and I dutifully carried TD's suitcase out to the curb and put it by the car. It was imaginal, but it was TD's suitcase and he was gonna go along with me. And so he needed to have his suitcase. And my father drove away without picking it up and putting it in the car. And I burst into tears and became hysterical. And my father, for the one and only time, probably in his whole life that he gave into this, went back so that I could get out of the car and pick up the imaginary suitcase and bring it along so TD would have his suitcase. Um, and when, you talk, when we talk to parents, we find that it's very, very, very common for kids to have these imaginary friends. But Michael says, could it be that in some cases, imaginary companions may not be merely creations of a child imagination, but beings from another dimension to which some children and adults may have access. So that's where we start getting weird. Um, and what's interesting, William James said, if the effects of something are real, then the source has to be real. So it becomes a question of how we define reality. Okay, in that first bio um, <laughs> that was read, it, it, it explains that I did not believe in this weird stuff until I was around 50. And that was a very long time ago. Um, and I certainly didn't believe in telepathy. And then we were gathering a whole bunch of parents and kids in the Adirondack Mountains at a, at a defunct ski lodge uh, to have what we, it, they were profoundly gifted kids and we were having this learning event, this festival of learning with other super, super brilliant kids. And so I was asked, because I'm a writer, I was asked to do a creative writing program with the kids, or at least a, a one day workshop. So we were sitting around, I was sitting on the floor. There were, I think five kids and myself. And I said, all right, let's, let's start making up a, a book or a story. And they wanted to do science fiction. And so they talked back and forth and there were these, you know, interchanges. Oh, that we, we should try this. No, that's not right. And finally they decided they got as far as having um, a, a flying saucer land uh, in the world the kids, these characters they had created were in. And we were, we were right by White uh, Pale Face Mountain white yeah pale face um anyway they got that thing down on the mountain after their arguments about how it was going to work work and then i said okay you stop for a minute you be quiet and i'll take notes so i'm madly taking notes to make sure i don't leave out anything about what the characters were what was going on and they were they were quiet i was in the room with them it was a small room they didn't say a thing so then when I said, okay, where shall we go from here? Girl raised her hand and she said, well, I think this should happen. And I said, oh, wait, okay, that's good. But we have to figure out what happens between here that we've got and 
where you've decided it should go, you're offering it should go well beyond where we were. So we have to figure out what happens between there, the first one and the, and the second part. So they started telling me where it went from here to there. And everybody was telling me the same story. There were no arguments. There was no, I don't think that will work. It was all the same story. And the hair went up on the back of my neck and my arms got all goose bumpy. And I said, you're all telling me the same thing. And they said, yeah, yeah. And I said, well, how did you all know the same thing? And they said, we worked it out the same way we worked out the first part. And I said, you didn't talk. They were stunned. They said, we didn't. And I said, I'm here with you. You did not talk, trust me here. And they said, well, how did we do that? And I said, well, it's called telepathy, but I didn't think it was real. And that was the beginning of, of my realization that maybe what I'd been told about my imagination and so on was not the whole story. Um, so I wrote Welcome to the Ark and the girl, I, and there are several poems in it, um, three poems, I think. And the girl whose poems I used was one of the people in that, in that group. And I based the character of Taryn on her. And she, they were all profoundly gifted. And this kid was, you know, began speaking as a toddler. And at age three, she told her mother that she could hear the stars sing. And, um, and it went on from there. She was indeed a mystical child who had connections with uh, other realms. So there's a lot of things that surely can't really be real. But it's quite interesting that all the cultures and all the religions have these kinds of beings. They have angels, they have fairies, they have pixies, they have gnomes, they have all sorts of different images and they share them. And really angels are kind of universal in the world. And so most people think they are imaginary. They, most people think they cannot really be. Well, because my focus has always been on profoundly gifted kids, the kids at the, at the uh, farthest from the norms, um, I used to go to the Hollingworth conferences, which were set up to, to be for parents and kids who were uh, parents of kids who were profoundly gifted and the kids. And when we were, when the when the families were gathered together like that, they would begin to talk to each other in a, in a way they didn't talk to people in their regular world very much. They would share some stories from their kids that they did not usually share. And it's really true that if people have extremely unusual experiences that don't fit their idea of reality, they don't talk about it. They don't usually talk about it. I think it's changing a little bit because online there's much more talk about these kinds of things than there used to be. Okay, when the Hollingworth gathering happened and I would be speaking of it and others of us, Linda Silverman and Kathy Carney and others of us who were there, we would share stories that people had told us that they didn't normally tell other people and consequently, at the Hollingworth Conference, other parents began sharing with each other the stories that couldn't be true, but their kids were experiencing them. So the blue car story is from a mother who's, who had two kids. The younger child had, was in, being put into her car seat one day and she said, mom, how come I have to sit in a car seat when Sarah didn't have to sit in a car seat when she was little? And her mother said, well, no, you both always had to sit in car seats, you know, and she's old enough, she doesn't have to anymore, but you still need to. And the girl said, no, in the blue car, she didn't have to sit in a car seat. 
And the mother didn't even remember a blue car at first. And then she remembered that they had had a, a two seater, like a, like a, I don't know, it was a Triumph or a, an MG or what, a, but a blue car when the first child was born. And so she said, well, uh, how did you know about the blue car? And she actually went around and asked some relatives if anybody else remembered the blue car and if anybody had told her that there had been a blue car and nobody else even was aware that there had been a blue car. And so finally she had the good sense to ask the kid herself. And she said, how did you know it was a blue car? And she said, well, mom, I used to come visit you all the time before I got born to decide if I wanted to come be born to you. So, a little hard to explain these stories. In the next one, I was a boy who um, said to his mother, I was grandpa's twin, but I didn't get born with him. Now this was very strange because the entire family, large expanded family kept saying about this kid that he looked so much like his grandfather and people would show photos of the grandfather when he was a kid and this kid and say, wow, that's an amazing resemblance. Boy, that family resemblance is intense. But when he began to say that he was his grandpa's twin but didn't get born with him, his mother went to her great grandmother who was luckily still alive and asked her about this question. And the grand, great grandmother's face went absolutely white. And she said, I never told anyone, but I was pregnant with twins and one died in utero. And I didn't tell people. So how did this kid know? And then there was a very famous story was on TV a lot for a while. Um, where a boy, when he was three, started screaming about fire and fire, and he was obsessed with planes, and he knew everything about World War II planes, and nobody could know where, the, where this kid was getting the information because he was little, and it was, this all happened before it was about, he was three and four and five, maybe, and he began talking, he knew the kind, he said he had been a pilot, he said he knew the kind of plane, and he told them all about the plane, and he said it had crashed into the, the sea. And he also had the first name of his co-pilot. And the parents who happened to be um, evangelical Christians were so upset by this that they thought, okay, well, we'll, we'll just check it out because there was so much information they could go check it out, and they did, and they found the family. And the family stories were that, yes, that, oh, that, he, knew the, he knew the ship that it had, the planes had taken off from. So the, the ship was real, they were in those planes, and they found the family of his co-pilot. Um, and I remember the first time I saw this talked about on a TV show, they had to bring someone to tell a different story just in case the, the people didn't think that this news program had dared to believe this weirdness. And the guy came and he said, oh, it was the child's imagination. Oh, it was the child. Oh, he heard about it from somewhere. There was absolutely no way this, could have, this kid could have heard about these things and gotten the name right and all the rest of it. And then if you read David Feldman's Nature's Gambit about profoundly gifted kids, he tells some pretty impressive and surprising stories in that as well. Um, I would suggest it's worth, it's worth reading, um, if only for that. And then this is, this is what also shouldn't be able to be but was. This is a picture of the dog Coyote, which is a wild dog. This is where I lived in North Carolina. This is Lake, this is Eagle Lake. And I found this wild dog and named him Coyote uh, when, he, when he was just loose in the woods. And it turns out he was a wild dog. He was not a dog that had been um, raised with humans. 
So it took me a long time to uh, get him comfortable with us. It took three years to get him in the house, actually. But anyway, we walked in the woods together every day. And one day, and I, I had a place I liked to stay and meditate. And I would sit in this little copse of pine trees and meditate while he went off. Because I, I, for a long time, several years, there was no way to put him on a leash. So he would go off in the woods and then he'd come back and we'd go home together. And one day he was not coming back and not coming back. And I really wanted to go home. So I just gave up. And then I thought, wait a minute. I had read um, Jane Goodall's books. And I said, she used to, she would just sort of pretend she was the chimpanzees and imagine where they might be. So I thought, all right, I'll pretend I'm Coyote. I'm a writer. I can do this. And I, so I became Coyote and I'm running through the woods as Coyote. And suddenly there's a deer that was hiding in some bushes and it jumps up and it kicks me in the face. And I was so shaken by this imaginary thing that I just stopped it and I, and I just said, okay, I'm just gonna go home and he will catch up to me when he, when he can. So I start home along the little road and out of the trees comes Coyote with a bleeding scar, a bleeding cut on his nose, exactly where the, the deer kicked me in my imaginary connection with him. And he had that scar for the rest of his life. Um, so that is just yet another, not possible to explain in any sort of ordinary ways. So as Shakespeare said, there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in your philosophy. So I've made this little collection of possible ways of being outside the normal expectation of reality. There's remote viewing. There's tons of research that shows that's possible. The trouble with remote viewing is people can often get where the, where the object is that may have been taken to the other side of the world. They can maybe get where it is, but they don't know when it's there. Um, and in fact, remote viewing was heavily studied by the Defense Department. So, and then out of body experiences, people can leave their bodies and have experiences outside their bodies. Animal communication, I can tell you, is absolutely um, real because eventually I was able to have communication with, with Coyote. It wasn't just that particular time that was just a powerful one with evidence but he would would he be gone and I'd say okay where am I gonna where are you gonna meet up with me on the way home and I would hear in my head I'll meet you by the big gate or something and I thought I'm a writer I'm making this up and then he would meet me by the exact place where he told me he would meet me as for conver conversations with trees um, my friend who's a scientist, Elizabeth Sartoris, uh, was, she did a lot of, of studying in, um, the, in the rainforest, and she asked a, um, uh, a shaman who was with her uh, in the woods how she could learn to talk to trees, and he said, you don't talk, you start by listening. And so I tried that, and that's in my book, in my novel, Listen. Uh, because in fact, I was able to actually have conversations with a, a, an old beech tree. And someone will ask, well, how can you, I mean, you live in the woods, you can't possibly have conversations with trees, you'd be overwhelmed. And I said, if you walk through Grand Central Station, when it's busy, you're not going to talk to every single person. Uh, you, you know, you just don't. There's reincarnation issues, which is, you know, the child who remembered um, previous life, near-death experiences. Uh, there's some very good books about near-death experiences. Um, uh, Anita Murjani's uh, Dying to Be Me and, uh, hang on, Eben Alexander's Proof of Heaven are both very powerful books about NDEs. And whoops, so, and life after death. 
Um, and I've had lots of experiences about that. And I'm not, I don't have time to tell you the various experiences I've had with communication from members of my family who've died, but I have lost a lot of members of my family. So I've also got a fair number of stories there. And if you're interested in any of this, um, there's a new book out just last year called The Science of Channeling. And channeling is the word that now, it used to be where someone was going to connect with some being in another dimension and they were going to talk through the person. And that was called channeling. And that's still being done by uh, quite a lot of people. But now the word channeling is used in order to cover the whole batch of these things. So these can all be called now channeling because it's, it's not explainable in physical terms. And except there's been tons of research. I have floor to ceiling bookcases full of the actual scientific research on these things. It's just that it's hard to convince people sometimes. Okay, so I think we're we are at a time when we should be taking questions now. And I'll save the last slide for for the very end. Perfect. Well, first, thank you so much, Stephanie. Um, I think it's been um, just a really interesting different type of presentation than what we've had here. And um, I appreciate that. And I appreciate you just kind of pushing all of our thinking just in general. Um, so one comment um, said, this is from, I think you would say Delcy. Um, she wrote, this is also validating my daughter at three had conversations with my grandma who had passed away years earlier. She'd be chattering away while playing in her room. And I'd ask her who she was talking to, Grandma Jackie with the biggest most peaceful smile on her face, pretty cool. So there's another kind of story that goes along with yours, which you might have a chance to share a few of them, we'll see. Um, but one big question that um, we have, uh, and again, if you're watching this and if you have any other questions, then please don't hesitate to put them into the chat and then I can relay them to Stephanie. But just, um, you know, when we're talking about this, and we had been talking about it before the presentation went on to how common are these dimensions of giftedness, even within gifted people? They're, they're far more common than we know because we don't talk about these things if they happen. And if kids talk about them, people will say it's your imagination. And the reason I want to talk to parents about gifted kids and these issues, <laughs> not everybody has them, but I want parents to know because I was shut down as a child in no uncertain terms. And the kids have to be very careful about who they tell because they will be ridiculed about it. And they have to have a place where their actual experience can be validated and supported. And it doesn't necessarily happen to everybody, but it's just like there are different, you know, some people are brighter than others. Some people are more intuitive than others. And there's all these different ways of being intuitive. That's why you have to think dimensions instead of levels, because there are differing dimensions. That's so, yeah, it's so funny because it reminds me, because um, I don't know a lot about this topic, um, but it, it reminds me of like some of those most classic stories that people love, like The Shining and things like that, um, and how... Uh, how different people kind of have those different dimensions at different times. Um, and I, and I appreciate how you touched on from like the parent's point of view. And that was one piece that you really wanted to lift up in this conversation in terms of, um, not always just writing things off as imagination. So, um, can you just expand on that a little bit more? So let's say that I'm a parent and they, my son or daughter has an imaginary friend what's what's the potential harm of writing that off from your perspective as just an imaginary the, uh, the pot potential harm of writing it off first of all you can you can make your kid afraid of these things 
him or herself. You can shut it down. It's not hard to shut down when it, when they're going to get, you know, and if, if a kid saw, saw a fairy in the woods and came back and told their friends, they would, they, we learn really early not to tell other kids stuff. And so we keep it secret. And then we begin to lose the ability to know it was real. And because it is real, you are cutting off a whole aspect of human life for your child when you insist that these things can't be. Um, and that's, I, it's no better in, from my point of view than to not accept their giftedness. You know, to, to not let their minds range where they can go because other kids their age aren't there yet. We know that's bad for gifted kids. Well, why is it not also bad for highly imaginative, highly intuitive kids to shut that down? And so what you do, you don't, you don't need to say, oh, that's ridiculous. Don't that's no. You just say, tell me about it. That's all you need to do. Tell me about it. Um, if, if grandmother has come and talked to her, what did she say? What is, what was your conversation like? Um, let them talk about it. And then if you don't believe it, that's your choice, but don't shut it down for them because I will tell you it's real. And there's just, and then go. <laughs> and then if you like investigating things, believe me, there are, volumes and volumes of really good research. And the scientists turn it off because as Michael said, I, Michael Pofsky thinks I'm negative to scientists and I'm not, he's a scientist, I love him dearly. But people used to think we argue all the time. We just disagree a lot, but, but he's, you know, he's much more open. And um, now I've forgotten why I wanted to mention Michael. <laughs> Because, because he's he says um, oh I know that this is why because he said that's like complaining that a priest is not a mystic or saying there is no such thing as a mystic but you know I, so when he says you don't like scientists because they don't do what you wish they would do but not all scientists are the equivalent of mystics in their scientific field. And there is an equivalency because there are some scientists who are very deeply involved in this study. And the Institute of Noetic Sciences is all about science. And so this is the research director who wrote this book about channeling. So that's interesting. So to expand on that, because we one of the questions that we had was kind of around um, like the belief or the support of these types of ideas in the gifted community. So Terry wrote that I've heard about spiritual giftedness being considered as another form of Gardner's multiple intelligences. Has it ever been seriously supported in the gifted community? Well, in the Hollingworth conferences, it was very much supported because there were so many people that had finally begun. I was also considered too far out one time, you know, when they do the evaluations. And, you know, I, I frequently keynoted those conferences and it occasionally my keynote would venture into some of these, not like this presentation tonight, but just a little bit of something. And so I was called too far out. And so I that that actually I considered that a badge of honor because <laughs> there's this closing off of whole aspects of mind and gifted people have quite complicated minds. I, I could see that being a badge of honor you'd wear, maybe a shirt. <laughs> um, it's okay if I'm too far out for you. <laughs> Um, another person wrote, um, this is from Julie. She wrote, so very thankful for Stephanie Tolan. She helped us believe in that which we couldn't see or touch. She allowed us the space and language to embrace our daughter and all of her experiences, no matter how different or unreal they seem. And then another person, Karen wrote that my son as a toddler would tell us he saw quote unquote crystals down the hall. He could see things we couldn't see. 
Even when I bathed him as a baby all alone, he would look past me over my shoulder and giggle as if someone was making faces at him. The hair on the back of my neck would go up. I couldn't see anyone. Well, that's important because the hair on the back of your neck is a real trigger when something makes you nervous and these kids don't have that. And that's why I want people to know they don't have to, sh they shouldn't shut it down because this is shutting down a really true aspect of the child, but they don't have to necessarily say, oh, that's great. I'm glad, just that, tell me about it. Mm -hmm. Tell me about it. Um, why do you, you know, what do you do with your friend, imaginary friend? But when, you know, I mean, there's one girl who, who came down um, early one morning to the kitchen and said, um, grandpa came to the end of my bed and told me I should come downstairs and tell you he's okay. And the mother thought, okay. Clearly she had a dream or something. Moments after the girl finished telling her that, the phone rang and it was her mother crying because her husband had just died. Wow. And no, I mean, no. these are not rare stories. We hear lots of stories when people are given an opportunity to tell us what has happened um, in, their, in their family. Mm -hmm. and and we listen we get more and more and more of them and I think that's kind of what we're seeing in the comments right now is all these people sharing their experiences with um students or their own children who did think and feel in this way um in this dimension so this question is from Anne she said I met a young man in a high school 10 years ago in an AP art studio class who was thought to be mentally ill without a diagnosis because of the things he would say or create. He was an extraordinary artist and visionary. How can you find a place for kids like this in everyday public school settings? See, that's the, that the other piece of it is calling people crazy or making them think maybe I'm going mad. It's, it's, that's why I that's why I moderately crusade on this subject, because there's not a good way to support this in our culture. And yet go online and start looking for this stuff. If you haven't been, you'll be astonished at how much there is. Um, it's it's become it's it's growing in awareness. But. Um, so <laughs> I think it is hard. And I, I mean, I think what my response would be just as a um, as an educator and as a principal is when we talk about um, knowing the whole child and knowing them by name, strength and need, then that means embracing all the parts of them, even the parts that we don't understand. Um, and I think ultimately when in doubt, my favorite phrase, which Stephanie, it's interesting that you kind of have a similar one is tell me more, <laughs> right? Because I think sometimes they like people in general just need those other people to talk to. Um, and I think that that kind of, you know, the, the last question that we have, and then you can go to your last slide, Stephanie, is from Karen. And she asked, how can we find a UNASA experience for a kid throughout the year? And not everyone might know what that is. So if you could just give a brief explanation as well. Okay, UNASA is a summer camp for, we started it a very long time ago now. Um, and it's, it's um, we intended it for profoundly gifted kids. I think it is less focused on the upper, upper ranges now than it was, but um, it's designed to do, to deal with the five aspects of the child. It's not all about their minds and their rational stuff. And it's not a math camp or a, they're, they're not studying stuff. So it's um, <laughs> head, head, heart, feelings, emotions, uh, social self, 
what's the fifth? Um, anyway, we try to balance it. Was, we used to think UNASA, the word UNASA, which is what we named the camp, we thought it meant balance. We were told by someone who claimed to be a, a, a Native American and said it meant balance. Turned out he had made this word up. So we have been saying it means balance for lots of years now, and it doesn't really. It's so, but the idea was to balance all pieces of the kid um, mind, body, <laughs> emotions, and social self. Oh, well, it's all right. We have different pieces of it in the camp, and there are not other camps like this, as far as any of us know. Um, so, and how to get it the whole rest of the year? I would say start Googling this stuff because there's just a tremendous lot of interaction between people who, who do know this kind of thing. There are, there are Susan, Suzanne Giesman who wrote Wolf's Message. If there's a book to convince you that this stuff is real, I would suggest Suzanne Giesman's Wolf's Message because the, the evidence is so intense. She happens to be a medium, but she was originally um, uh, not only in the Navy, but um, the, ch the chief of staff's adjutant, I forget what she, what it was, she was called, um, but she was a, she was very rational, very uh, by the book person. And uh, her daughter, her uh, stepdaughter got hit by lightning and killed. And this led her to a search about that. And she ended up studying in London to become a, a medium because she was getting in, she was getting messages from her, from her stepdaughter. And so she, and now she, that's what she does. That's she's, she's a medium and she makes a living at it. Um, and she's extremely good. If you read Wolf's message, um, it may lead you on to some things that you didn't know you could imagine, but it's, uh, I just know that it's a piece of who we are. And not everybody is, as you know, not everybody's a math person, not everybody's a writer, not everybody's an artist or a musician. And I guess I would like to think of these all as gifts. Absolutely. So if you uh, can go to your last slide and then we can wrap up for the evening because it's almost six o'clock here. Okay, the last slide, um, it's technically not because there's a, a, a farewell one, but you had mentioned these, these um, two books and most of, my, most of my work has been fiction, but I also write about gifted kids and, and this one is um, just uh, for adults, help you to uh, take charge of your life. And this one's my, this is really a collection of my, of my, um, articles and, and nonfiction essays about giftedness um, that have been, you know, I've been doing this for 40 some years, so. <laughs> Great, well, thank you so much, Stephanie. And thank you to everybody who joined us here tonight for your comments, for your questions, and just your attention on um, yet another topic. And would you like to read this, Stephanie, to close it out? You are not accidental, nor are your children. Existence needs you. Without you, something will be missing in existence and nobody can replace it. And with that, Osha the Zen Master, we will end our evening. Thank you guys, everybody so much for coming. Take care. Bye.